Would you like to find your own gold? Would you like to be able to recognize valuable gold ores if you saw them in the field? But in order to be able to find stuff like that, you need to know what they look like, of course. Gold is a very precious metal and gold bearing ores are found here and there scattered all over the earth. You should know that rich gold ores have a high value in and of themselves, a value much greater than the bullion value of the gold that's in them, even without the metal being extracted from the rock. I'm Chris Ralph, the professional prospector, and today we're talking about the secrets of what gold ores look like. We're going to cover it in detail, we're going to go over everything you need to know, and get into a lot of the information about different kinds of gold ore. We're going to talk about gold minerals, gold ores, and gold geology, and the things you need to know to find them. And I'm going to give you at the end some good suggestions about how you can find rich gold ores out in the field. A lot of folks stack and save bullion for financial security, and gold has always been an enduring form of wealth. Now, paper currencies, they come and go. Sometimes they're worth something, sometimes they're not. Gold is at the center of the world of precious metals and jewelry, but it also has important industrial applications, especially in the realm of electronics. In this video, we're going to examine a whole lot of different kinds of gold ores and what they look like. And probably the first thing you need to understand is there is no one kind of gold ore that they're all the same. No, there's lots and lots of different ones. And that's why you need some knowledge to be able to recognize them in the field. Otherwise, if you just knew one type, you could stumble by a, a, a type that's different and completely miss it. We'll also consider the geology of uh, gold deposits. You know, we're talking about natural gold alloys, the geology of common types of gold deposits. And then we'll finish off with suggestions for gold prospectors to be able to find hard rock gold ores for yourself. Let's start by looking at some of those different kinds of ores. And we're gonna start with ores with easily visible gold. These are, of course, the most valuable type. Sometimes gold occurs in very high-grade ores uh, with easily visible gold in them. Now, the gold in these ores occurs as the native metallic metal, but these very high-grade ores are comparatively rare. While there are many deposits where metallic gold is the primary metal that they're seeking after, most gold ores contain only minimal amounts of visible gold, or some of them just have no eyeball visible gold at all. You have to use a microscope to see the gold. It's that small. Still, gold mineral deposits are often very spotty, and even if you have a deposit where the bulk of the gold is in the form of uh, small bits and stuff that you're not going to be able to easily see with your eye, still, they're spotty and differential, and, and sometimes there'll be areas in deposits like that that have coarse gold, easily visible, and that's the kind of stuff we're talking about in this segment. When high-grade ores are found, the native gold is commonly seen in the form of wires, a small crystals, thin flakes, or sheets. If the gold particles are large enough and nicely crystalline, these kinds of specimens can have a great value much over the bullion gold value of any gold that's in them. Collectors prize these specimens because they're rare and they can be, of course, very beautiful. And because of this, they're willing to pay high prices for them. Prospecting for coarse gold for, for these uh, ores with easily visible gold is perhaps best done with a metal detector. You can go over old mine dumps, and of course, the old miners never on purpose threw away this kind of ore, but when they accidentally did, your metal detector will sound off and tell you that there's a bit of high-grade ore in a dump pile. Prospecting for this easily visible gold with a metal detector can be very lucrative. As I say, both old mine dumps and sometimes vein exposures on the surface or inside the old mines can be very productive and yield specimens with this valuable, easily visible gold. Let's take a look at some easily visible gold specimens. This is just the kind of thing you'd be looking for. Beautiful crystals of gold together with some quartz and other matrix. Now this is a kind of a small specimen, but the guy who found this, he found oh, half a dozen pieces more or less like this, and he sold the, the group 
for $10,000. And that was when gold was at something like twelve or 1300 an ounce. Here's a piece with some nice gold. I've found things like this in dumps with my metal detector. And, you know, that can be a pretty nice find. And it's kind of questionable whether or not you want to crush this. It's probably more valuable as a specimen. In these kinds of super high-grade specimens, pieces with nice crystalline gold like this are the ones that get the, the highest dollar. Sometimes the gold in these pieces is evenly sprinkled through the quartz, as in this specimen. But sometimes it's more concentrated. Frequently, the gold is in quartz, as in this specimen and most of the ones I've shown you. Um, and this specimen has only a tiny bit of sulfides. You can see a band of quartz through the middle. And in the lower part of the rock, there's some dark lines. Those are little zones of sulfide-rich areas. But still, in the quartz, it's a beautiful contrast between the white of the quartz and the beautiful metallic yellow of the gold. Although not always, it's common that uh, the high-grade stuff will occur in small quartz seams or zones within a larger vein. This specimen set was collected uh, from an area where the veins were rather narrow, but they were filled with gold. If you were metal detecting around inside a vein and you got a screaming signal, you might look up and find something like this. This is actually a patch of gold, a super rich gold ore, in a quartz vein that's still in place. Still, the vein is in the country rock. It hasn't yet been blown out. And so you'd have to be careful about taking stuff like this out because uh, you don't want to smash all your beautiful gold specimen gold into smithereens and bits. Now, lest you get the wrong idea that gold only occurs in white quartz, um, here's a specimen from a very oxidized vein that was mineralized, and there's a lot of iron rust staining there. Uh, but there's a beautiful sheet, a beautiful leaf of gold sticking out of the rock. Here's another beautiful specimen of leaf gold. Now, there's so much gold here, you can't hardly see the rock that it's on, but the rock is also well oxidized and mineralized rust color material. But this leaf gold is just spectacular. Here's a specimen from Australia where there's hardly any quartz at all. This gold is wrapped around some hematite iron oxide and basically iron ore. And the gold is just in beautiful contrast with it. Now, all the pieces I've shown you so far are comparatively small. They're something you easily could pick up and carry with you. But this is not one of those. This is a huge boulder. The weight of this thing is 114 pounds. And it was found in the 1970s. So it's not some find that was made in the days of mining in the 1800s. This was made by somebody much later, long after the mines were closed. And it's estimated to contain over 300 ounces of gold in it. So, boy, I'd figure out some way to get that out of the hills if I found a piece like that with 300 ounces of gold in it. Next, let's talk about ores with only barely visible gold. In other words, small amounts of visible gold, not big, showy, spectacular specimens. Rich gold ores do not always have these large, showy amounts of gold visible in them. And even specimens that sound off weakly on a metal detector may not have a lot of easily visible gold. Or there may only be some tiny particles of gold that the metal detector is seeing. That's why when you're looking for gold ores, and of course you may be mostly looking for the rich stuff, but even so, you should bring with you a loop, a magnification loop like uh, well, I always use in the field when I'm looking at gold ores because a lot of the gold is small and you may have to look very closely at the specimen to see where the gold is or to see any gold in it. And although these specimens with barely visible gold don't have the showy, spectacular value of the easily visible gold specimens, they still can have a lot of gold in them. And you can have specimens like this that they may not have that specimen bonus value, but you can crush them up and some of them will have quite a bit of nice gold inside. These kinds of deposits, uh, the kinds of ores, are not always well detectable with a metal detector. Sometimes you have to kind of eyeball them and recognize the type of minerals that are associated with the gold. Like I say, sometimes there's particles in there that are enough that they'll make a very sensitive gold detector sound off, but not always. Let's take a look at some specimens of gold ores with this category of barely visible gold. Now, there is no nice, clean line that demarks between gold with lots of visible gold and gold that's only maybe barely visible. 
But this is a piece that's kind of on the line. The gold is plainly there, but it's not in huge showy amounts. Um, I put this with uh, barely visible, even though it's plenty visible. Here's a piece of gold that was found with a metal detector that has a little gold in it, not huge amounts. Uh, you look at it, it's not obvious, but in the lower left corner, down around the dark minerals there, there's a kind of a ring of a small amount of gold. And this could be crushed up and made into some nice gold. It was found in Australia. This piece has some little wires that are visible on it. You can probably see those. It's one of the ones with a little bit of gold. I wouldn't say maybe barely visible, but it's not got a lot of gobs of gold. This is a specimen I picked up in Nevada, and boy, you, you really have a hard time seeing gold in this. Um, you see the blue kind of on the right-hand side. Uh, that's some copper mineralization, and in among the blue there, there's a little bit of gold. So this is one of those pieces where it truly is barely visible. And no, it would not have sounded off on a metal detector. But still, crushed up and the gold extracted and recovered, um, this would, you know, if you had enough pounds of this, it would yield a pretty good amount of gold. Here's another specimen of well-oxidized ore. And in a, holding it in your hand, you really can hardly see any gold. But if you were to put a loop on it, you'd see a number of little flecks of gold in this rock. It's fairly rich because uh, the number of flecks is not small. So if you crushed it up, you certainly would get decent gold out of it. Next, let's take a look at specimens of gold ore with no visible gold. In other words, this is ore that you can't see any gold either with your eyeball or with a 10 times loop looking at it. Um, it's some of these things, it's not that they don't contain particles of gold, it's just that the particles are very small and they're widely dispersed and so it's not very obvious that they do have gold in them, even though they do. The truth is, is that most gold ores that are mined commercially and processed and taken out for their gold value in commercial large gold mining operations fall into this category. They may have some gold ore, like there's a, there's a certain operation in Nevada that produces some really showy spectacular specimens at a place called Round Mountain. Uh, but they uh, also produce a whole lot of gold that comes from ores that you can't really see any gold in them. And of course, the big Carlin mines in Nevada, that gold is so small that it requires a microscope to see it. Many of these gold ores have less than a half an ounce of gold per ton of rock. And you gotta think about that, a half an ounce, not very much, in a ton of rock, which is a huge amount of rock. Yet, like I say, most commercial operations, most of the large operations, this is the bulk of the ore that they mine. It's this lower grade, uh, really small particles of gold widely dispersed through the ore. The size of the gold in many hard rock ores, many common hard rock ores, is very small. We're talking like dust size. Now, with a microscope, with a, a loop, you can see small dust sized particles, but when it's widely dispersed, half an ounce in a ton, you know, they're spread out so far, it may be hard to find them on the surface of a specimen. And yet, they're decent ores, and the gold mining companies are making a profit doing this. Uh, but that explains, because the gold particles are so small, why gold uh, ores with easily visible gold are a lot less common than the ores with no visible gold, but still a decent amount of gold in them. Let's take a look at some ores with no visible gold. This is what a lot of quartz vein material looks like. You know, uh, you can see the white quartz, but there's also iron staining and rust from pyrites and that sort of thing. But whatever gold is in here is so small that you really can't see individual flecks and little bits of gold, but yet it contains plenty enough gold to be mined and worked at a profit. Literally tens of millions of ounces of gold have come from rock that looks more or less like this. This is the ore of the famous Carlin type mines in Nevada. They continue to produce millions of ounces every year. Uh, this ore grades a little more than a tenth of an ounce per ton, but they mine it by the giant truckload full tens of thousands of tons often in a day. And they process huge amounts of it and make a lot of gold. But there's no visible gold in this unless you're able to slice it very thin and use a microscope. Then you can see with a, with a powerful microscope, you can see little bits of gold. 
This is some ore I picked up at an old side of a custom mill in Nevada. It's from Nevada. I know where it came from. Um, and there's claims out there, but this ore I was hoping would produce a little better than a half an ounce. And I tested it in a recent video. I showed the results. It was only about a quarter of an ounce, but still there's no visible gold. I've looked at a number of these samples with the loop very carefully. There's nothing visible. A quarter of an ounce in a ton of rock is pretty widely dispersed gold, but yet all the samples of this stuff that I've crushed does have some gold in it. The most productive gold region in the world has been the Witwatersrand area of South Africa. And this is a sample of that ore. Now there's no visible gold in it, but I have seen some specimens of this type of material that do have visible gold. But this, this piece does not have any such of that. Now you can see the little the round bleeps. This was once a placer gravel. The little round blobs of quartz were in the gravel and it's been exposed it was buried and exposed to such heat and pressure that it's literally been petrified into a solid rock and there's certain layers of this material uh, in the deposit and just like a placer you know there's layers of concentration on bedrock or false bedrock and they mine those rich layers and that's what's produced so much gold from south africa for so many years Next, let's take a look at ores with a lot of sulfide minerals in them. Now, these most, most of the ores we've looked at so far have been ores with maybe a little sulfides or very little sulfides at all, almost none. And so that's what we've looked at so far. Now we're going to take a closer look at ores that are closely associated with base metals. So you get a lot of pyrite, which is an iron sulfide. You get a lot of galena, sphalerite, and a whole lot of other ores with sulfide minerals that are associated with gold pretty commonly. And so these kinds of ores are an important class. Now, a lot of this ore, you know, it, it, a lot of gold that comes from like copper mines, like the big porphyry mines and that kind of stuff, the gold comes as a byproduct. And so there's tiny amounts of gold in the primary copper ore, which is the primary copper mineral is chalcopyrite. It's a copper iron sulfide, but there may be tiny amounts of gold in there. And so the gold gets captured with the copper. And then eventually when the copper is purified, the gold is recovered. Now, other kinds of ore, just with lots of pyrite or other sulfides, um, the miners found them really hard to work. Uh, the oxidized version of this when the ore has been on or near the surface for a long time uh, basically the pyrite and some of the other sulfide minerals are converted to rust and other oxide minerals those were easy for the old time miners to process but as they mined down and mined down and mined down in their deposits they would get below the zone of oxidation where where air and water from the surface really affect affected the minerals and get down below that and you get into the primary sulfides and those sulfides were much harder for them to work. Now the near surface ores where it's well oxidized and a lot of the pyrite is converted to you know limonite and gertite and other things which are basically rust. Uh, when you get to those things you get a lot of times a uh, material that geologists call Gaussian and Gaussian materials can they don't always, but they can contain some good gold in them. These ores, both the uh, oxidized Gaussian type or the original primary sulfide type, are widely distributed across the U.S. and other places around the earth. They can occur in both, both vein type systems and wider load type systems. Let's take a look at some of these rich sulfide ores that we find associated with gold. This is an example of ore that has a large amount of sulfides in it. You can see all the gray that's uh, galena, that's a lead sulfide, uh, sphalerite, which is a zinc mineral, uh, various silver salts, uh, chalcopyrite, which is a copper ore, and of course regular pyrite too, and then also gold. This ore was very rich in both silver and gold. 
But when the material has had enough time near the surface to fully oxidize, you get this, which is basically a Gaussian. It's a, a mixture of iron oxides and some quartz, and uh, it can contain decent gold. This material is from Nevada, and it's a Gaussian, and it does have lower grade gold, but suitable for a commercial mining operation. Gaussian ores can be quite rich. You can see all the cubic imprints on the kind of tan colored quartz on this specimen. Those were all big pyrite crystals, which have all been oxidized and leached away. Gaussian ores can actually be quite rich sometimes. You can see all the easily visible gold in this specimen. You know, I'd class this as uh, easily visible gold, but this is also a Gaussian made of iron oxides. Next, let's take a look at the gold telluride ores. Now, gold doesn't form stable minerals with any other element other than tellurium. And it easily combines with tellurium to form gold tellurides. Silver also combines with tellurium, and so you get a very commonly gold and silver, or gold, silver, silver uh, tellurides uh, with varying amounts of gold and silver in them. The telluride minerals are something that prospectors tend to kind of scratch their head over. And the problem is not that nobody knows about them. The problem is they tend to look like other minerals. And so you may see some super rich gold telluride, and it may look a lot like some arsenopyrite, which is similar in color and similar in nature. The arsenopyrite may be worth very little, but the gold telluride may be worth huge. And the telluride minerals are often found in the same kind of veins as the sulfides that don't have a lot of value. So you may find some sulfide that doesn't have much value, but you may find some gold telluride that's super valuable. And no prospector wants to throw out rich ore thinking it's something else, right? Oh, super rich, you know, I'm looking at this and it's like, ah, this is worthless arsenopyrite. You know, when it's really, I just threw out a $10,000 worth of gold. Recognizing whether what you have is a, a sulfide mineral that's not very valuable or whether you have super rich gold tellurides, you know, sometimes it takes an assay, a fire assay, to determine which you have. And I will we'll admit, I'll tell you that the, the sulfide minerals are much, much, much more common than the gold tellurides, which are fairly rare. They tend to occur in certain types of deposits, certain classes of deposits, in a district. So you have a district that has rich in gold telluride minerals, but most other districts will not be. An example of one of the districts that are rich in gold tellurides is the Cripple Creek District in Colorado. Let's take a look at some gold telluride samples and talk about the gold telluride ores. Here's a gray sulfide mineral on the surface of this rock that, you know, it maybe looks a little bit like arsenopyrite, maybe galena or sphalerite, and it doesn't look like anything much. But this is super rich calaverite gold telluride. Here is some super rich calaverite ore from Australia. And again, the sulfide looking material in the middle, that's the rich gold ore, you know, it just looks like maybe some light colored pyrite. Because this stuff looks so much like common sulfide minerals, that's why it tends to be a problem and confuses prospectors. Here is a close-up of some calaverite crystals, and you can see that they're more rod-shaped rather than the typical short square or cubic or other similar forms of most sulfide minerals. Now, if you are super interested in this topic, I did a whole video on gold telluride ores, and I'm going to put a link to it up here if you want to take a look. Next, let's talk about natural gold alloys. Most people think that gold is this beautiful buttery yellow metallic kind of color, and of course the yellow gold color is a beautiful color, but it doesn't always occur that way in nature. You can find things that look different from that that are still gold. The element that most commonly alloys with gold, even in good yellow gold nuggets, that kind of thing, they often contain five, 10, maybe even 15% silver. And silver is the element that commonly alloys with gold in natural deposits. But if you have a deposit that's rich in silver, and so you get a lot of silver into the gold, then you get a pale yellow colored material called electrum. 
Here's the common yellow color that everybody's used to for gold. This is a beautiful gold nugget from Colorado. This is an example of Electrum from Mexico from a gold silver mine. And you can see it's certainly not the same color as gold that you're used to. This is probably 60% gold, 40% silver, something like that. There are even mixtures that have a kind of a greenish cast to them. So if you're hunting gold and you find something that looks like it could be gold, but it's not the right color, eh, you may have a beautiful specimen of Electrum. Next, we're going to talk about the geology of common types of gold deposits. Now, not all gold deposits are the same. Okay, that's an important thing for any prospector to know. Gold deposits can form in many different kinds of geologic environments. And as we've seen, looking at the different kinds of gold ores, gold ores from different kinds of environments can look very different. Now, all of these types are driven by hot rock and circulating water. Um, there's a natural convection when, when there's hot rock, whether it be solidified or still molten as magma, um, the water, uh, hot water tends to circulate and, you know, a, a, as stuff gets hot, it rises and cooler water comes in. And so you get this ongoing circulation of hot water that makes these deposits. Now I have a diagram that we're going to use for this discussion and looking at the different kinds of gold deposits. These are not an exhaustive list. They're just uh, the common ones that you're likely to see. And basically it's placers, which you're familiar with, epithermal, uh, volcanic, volcanogenic massive sulfides, VMS, porphyry, carlin type, and orogenic, which is a mountain building or mother load type of deposit. Here's my little basic diagram about the geology of gold deposits. You know, it just shows the depth relationship of some of them, and it doesn't really get into super a lot of detail, but we'll talk about each one. Of course, placers are up on the surface in streams or on hillsides. Um, the uh, blue-gray block there, it's showing a black smoker at the bottom of the ocean. And at similar depths and pressures, you have epithermal, which is still comparatively near to the surface. Further down, you have porphyry type deposits and carlin types. And then at the greatest steps for formation of gold deposits are the orogenic or mountain building related types of deposits. Let's take a look at some of these different kinds of uh, geologic environments and different kinds of situations that gold deposits form in. And of course, we'll start with the placers. The placers, of course, are the type most commonly sought by prospectors. Um, they form by erosion. So if there's a, a hard rock vein that has some gold in it, and as the hillside or mountainside or whatever erodes, it, as the water and rain wash the, the mountainside down, the gold gets washed into drainages, and then you have these loose uh, particles of gold that are freed from the original hard rock ore. The gold then accumulates in places like inside bends or behind obstructions, other places where it's common for heavy minerals to accumulate. Because they're formed by erosion, the kind of erosion environment makes a big difference to what kind of placer that you would see. So what you see in a desert isn't necessarily the same as what you'd see in a forest. And if, even if you were in a jungle, it wouldn't be necessarily the same as a forest either, and certainly not the same as a desert. Now, placer deposits can form, and you know if they formed in ancient times, and were never worked because there weren't miners around to work them, they can actually be buried and fossilized, and, uh, and the gravels turn to literally solid rock as it gets petrified. In fact, the most productive gold deposits in the world are fossilized placers. And this is the water strand, which we took a look, look at the ore from. Uh, these are a gravel that's been compressed and petrified into a solid rock. It's no longer gravel, it's rock. But these were one time placer gravels. So that's a look at placers. Next, we'll take a look at the epithermal type of deposit. Epithermals are a type of deposit that are found comparatively close to the surface, but down a little ways. The most likely places to prospect for epithermals are areas in and around a volcanic activity. 
where comparatively small amounts of uh, material have been eroded from the surface since the time of the volcanic activity. Most of the deposits of the epithermal type are fissure veins that occupy fault zones and that sort of thing because of course the faults give uh, a place for circulating hot waters to flow in because it's a break in the rock. But they can also be in areas where there's been large-scale fracturing or the rock tends to be porous. Then they can form larger disseminated types of deposits and epithermal types of deposits in that class are known as well. Epithermal deposits can be very rich and most of the really super rich bonanza type of gold ores that were worked in the late 1800s were of that category. They're frequently found in the igneous rocks themselves, the, the actual volcanic rocks themselves, but they are, can be found in adjoining older rocks. Now the types of volcanic rocks that they're found in is usually the more uh, acidic, so it's more rhyolite to andesite and much less and very un uncommon in basalt, although it does occur in basalt sometimes. Examples of mining districts that are of this type include uh, Virginia City and Tonopah in Nevada um, and Cripple Creek in Colorado. These mining districts, because they're associated with uh, the volcanic activity, are commonly found near or in the general area of the ring of fire that goes around the Pacific. But they're also found in other areas where there's been volcanic activity, including parts of Europe known for volcanoes including places like uh, Turkey, Hungary, or Romania. Next, we're gonna talk about the BMS types of deposits. Those are volcanogenic massive sulfide. My diagram here shows that they are formed on the seafloor deep underwater at the bottom of the ocean. These are uh, kind of an unusual thing. Um, you may have seen pictures, uh, because they've only been able to take pictures of these things uh, for the last 20 or 30 years of the black smokers that are on the ocean floor. You have a vent that it, there's volcanic activity in the area and it spews out this black material. Sometimes it's white. There are white smokers too, but it's, it's like a black smoke that comes out of these vents and they're kind of unusual looking, but the black smoke that comes out is actually a finely divided sulfide mineral set and they can be different kinds of sulfide minerals depending on the rocks that the hot water from the lava is circling it's, it's not lava coming out but the the nearby lava ca causes the hot water to circulate and it comes out these vents and the the sulfide minerals that come out the vents settle out in the general vicinity you know within a few hundred yards of the uh, vents themselves the different kinds of sulfide minerals can be rich in copper, that's a very common one, but also lead, zinc, and they can have significant amounts of silver and gold as well. Eventually these deep ocean deposits get, by tectonic uh, uh, collisions, get pushed up on land and there they get mined as these VMS type deposits. Next we'll take a look at porphyry deposits. So here's my diagram for the porphyry type deposits and it kind of shows the bright colored rock. You've got a real bright on the inside and it's basically a magma that comes up and cools in two stages with an outer shell solidifying, but the inner part still being hot and magma and the outer shell tends to fracture heavily. And then those fractures allow for liquids to circulate and mineral deposits to be created because gold can also be closely associated with porphyries. Now these are very large low-grade deposits that are uh, typically associated with the outer margins of igneous intrusive rock. So the hot water or hot rock is rising from deep within the earth, the uh, top of it gets cracked and, and broken, it solidifies and gets cracked and broken, and the heat from the system drives it and fills the rock with minerals usually sulfides, often copper or molybdenum. Most of these deposits contain at least some gold. With the, usually they're mined, like I say, for copper or moly, uh, but they contain some gold and the gold is recovered along with the base metals, but some of them are actually very gold rich and produce principally gold. The next type we'll take a look at is the Carlin type. The Carlin type are a very unusual type where 
uh, gold is disseminated through sedimentary rocks. The mineralizing fluids come up along steep faults and they get into these limey rocks, limestone and stuff, and replace it with silica and mineralization that includes gold. This is an unusual type where it's, the deposits are bound with sedimentary strata and associated with steep faults. The carbonate rocks that they deposit in are mineralized and altered. The host rock is usually some form of limestone or, or a siltstone with lime, a lot of lime in it. Uh, acidic waters from these deposits, like I say again, the hot waters uh, tend to leach out and destroy the limestone and leave silica and other things, breccia, broken rock features in their place. And while the majority of the, this class of deposit has been found in Nevada, there have been some other areas that have where this kind of deposit has been found and it's worth looking for in other locations because they're comparatively new and comparatively poorly understood. The last type we're going to take a look at is the orogenic or mother load kind of deposit. The orogenic or uh, mother load type of deposit is the deepest form deposit of the ones we're looking at by far. These deposits form two to five and sometimes even up to 10 miles deep in the earth, far below the surface where the effect of the colliding plates generates heat. This really is the most productive of all of them, um, of, the, of the common types of gold deposits found around the world. And they're directly related to mountain building. That's what orogenic means from, I don't know, the Greek or the Latin, or whatever. But it, it has, has to do with uh, generated from mountains, okay? They tend to be associated with uh, tectonic plate collision. So you have plates colliding, they build up into, push up into mountains. There's a lot of different names for this class. Like I say, a mother load type, mesothermal gold they're called, um, low sulfide quartz veins, gold only veins, shear zone hosted gold, greenstone belt gold, and turbidite or slate belt hosted gold. They're very widespread across the planet and something like 75% of all the gold mined in history has come from either these types of hard rock deposits or the placers that are derived from them. Now some of them are located near to places where there's current plate collisions or plate collisions that were going on in recent times that would include the mother load of the Sierra Nevada in California. But some of them are also located in places where there hasn't been collisions for eons of time. And these are called cratons. They're bodies of um, solid plate material that haven't been moving around for a long, long time, but long, long ago they were. These cratons are stable rocks, like I say, and part of a continental crust. But they, like I say, once were part of collisions, and examples of this include places in West Africa and Australia. Finally, let's take a look at some suggestions for gold prospectors. You know, you want to find this kind of gold? Okay, let's talk about where to find it. To be honest, the best places to search for these gold deposits are in and around known gold mining districts where gold has been found in the past. The miners previously worked these areas for gold and you know they never really got it all. There's always going to be some more to be found. If there are hard rock mines nearby that produce some coarse gold, the areas that are downslope from those hard rock mines are good places to detect with a metal detector. I know folks who have done this and detected areas below mines that produce some coarse gold and they've been very successful and made some good money. And of course, if, if it's an air, a mine that produced coarse gold, the native gold specimens that you might find, you know, chunks of the vein that have broken off and are working their way downhill, those specimens can be very valuable. Knowing the different types of gold deposits that are found in your area is an important thing. It's an important thing for you to know your area. It gives you the home field advantage. For every area that there's gold deposits, each area will have its own specific uh, characteristics and indicators that work best for that area. In many locations, the veins are formed along what were fault zones at one time because they allow the hot waters to circulate. And you know, different areas will have different kinds of characteristics, but the indicators will almost always be consistent for one particular district. 
Sometimes a deposit of placer gold can be traced back to its original hard rock source. I know some guys who have been really successful with this technique and found rich gold pockets tracing placer back to its original source. Now sometimes it's worthwhile to chase the source and other times it's not. It doesn't always work. Some places it does, some places it doesn't. In theory, the down, uh, downhill dispersion pattern is uh, something that forms a triangle. That, that if you had a pocket here, that the material disperses down in a triangular shape. But of course, in real life, it's not so perfect, but still, gold works its way down. It doesn't work down in a perfectly straight line. It tends to spread as it goes down. And the, the steeper the hill, the narrower the spread pattern, the more gentle the slope, the wider the dispersion pattern. The number of nuggets or pieces of gold that are in that dispersion place will tend to be highest along the center line of the triangular shape. The main techniques for source hunting uh, is to take samples along a drainage and determine the limits of the gold bearing area. So if you sample along a drainage and the gold stops here and it starts there, you know that that's the beginning and the end of your, your zone. And you trace it up then on both sides of the hill. Hopefully you'll get gold on one side going up one hill and not gold on the other side going up the other side of the hill, you know, in a drainage. And then when you take samples along the side hill that's productive, you continue to move up and then line out the length of gold in the, the trace. And then as you move up, you should, you know, the, the length that produces gold will be shorter each time. And as you get closer and closer to the source, then your length will get closer and closer together until you finally get to the zone where the origin of the gold, the pocket that's shedding that gold, is found in the ground. Generally, like I say, the samples are taken in a line parallel with the drainage as you go up and like I say, that gets narrower and narrower until you get to the top source. That is a very successful technique. Now, another important thing to know is that, especially for epithermal types of deposits, there's a zone of alteration that often surrounds these deposits. The country rock is often something that prospectors can use as an indication of mineralization. The type of alteration that commonly surrounds the epithermal deposits is called propolytic alteration. And it happens because as the mineralizing fluids come up, they tend to put um, a certain amount of pyrite into adjoining rocks, the, the wall rock, the country rock. And as it goes into that adjoining rock, then when it weathers, the pyrite weathers to, turns to limonite or rust, and then it also turns to sulfuric acid. And the sulfuric acid breaks down the adjoining rocks. And so you get this zone of alteration that's much wider than the narrow vein itself. It isn't always perfectly equidistant so that the vein is smack dab in the middle. Sometimes the vein may be closer to one side of the alteration than the other, but it's still that wide zone of alteration can give you a great indication of a vein that may be valuable and is located nearby. The prospector searching for hard rock gold deposits should also really take into consideration favorable rock types for deposits in that district. The idea of favorable rock types also includes specific kinds of rock contacts. See, usually in a mining district, most of the veins, or the valuable veins, will be found only in one or two different kinds of host rock. And so if you have a geologic map, you can look at a geologic map and see where that host rock is found in the ground and check out those areas. Another type of thing, like I say, is rock contact. So you may have a vein that's uh, occurring at a contact of rock A and rock B where they come together, that's where your vein is going to be. And again, you can search this out on geologic maps because it'll tell you where that type of rock is found or where that contact is found. And knowing these things, knowing a little bit about geology and a little bit about rocks and minerals can go a long way. You don't have to be a super duper expert, but knowing a little bit about recognizing rocks and uh, different kinds, at least the favorable kinds of rocks that you're looking for, be able to recognize those, can be really helpful for you when you're out in the field. 
Now, like I say, sometimes there's uh, wider zones of low grade material and the search for these uh, low grade but large ore bodies is intense. A lot of geologists are looking for that, especially here in my home state of Nevada, uh, but there's still more out there to be found. And prospectors in the past, individual prospectors have found some of these deposits that geologists didn't find. And so it's worthwhile knowing the geology of your area and the favorable rock types and where the deposits occur because you might find something really valuable. Now when searching for gold deposits, what you know makes all the difference in the world. Uh, finding the minerals you're seeking, you know, you need to know what they look like but you need to understand how they occur and where they occur so you'll be looking in the right places that you might find them. And the knowledge that makes all the difference that's what I wrote a book about. I wrote a book called Fistful of Gold and it tells you all the things you need to know to be a successful gold prospector and find those fistful of gold. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book right now. So this is my book, Fistful of Gold. You can see it's an encyclopedia distilling down my 45 plus years of prospecting experience plus my degree into the parts that you need to know. I spent most of 10 years writing this. It was not just a simple effort that, uh, oh, I sat down and wrote it. You can see it's like a quarter of a million words. It's not something you're going to read through in a day or maybe even a week or more. But it's got a lot of information and reference material that you can come back to. You know, you can read it once and read it again and get more out of it because there's just that much depth of material in this. I wrote this book because I want you to have the skills to go out and find fistfuls of gold for yourself. And if you have the skills and know what you're doing and get out in the field and make a real effort, you can find significant gold. It's not easy. I'm not going to tell you that because, you know, gold, it, it wouldn't be, you know, close to $2,000 an ounce, which is what it is right now, it wouldn't be so expensive if it was easy to find. It's not easy. You just can't walk out into an old gold field and start picking up nuggets. If the, if the gold was easy to see and find, the old timers would have picked it up and taken it themselves. So you got to have skill. You got to know what you're doing. You got to be able to, to master what it takes to find gold. And you've got to have the persistence and put in the effort to find the material, to find the gold or diamonds or gemstones that you're looking for. Now, this has book has geology, it has facts about gold, it has stuff about diamonds and platinum, but it's mostly about gold, gold deposits, how gold deposits form, how placer and nuggets form, you know, all the questions you've probably wanted to ask. The book is available on Amazon, and I'll put a link to it in the description below, but you can look up on Amazon, This Full of Gold, and by Chris Ralph, and find this book. Now, the book, if you look on it, it has a very high rating. It has like a 4.7 or 4.8 out of 5, which is really high. I mean, it's hard to please everybody, but I'm close to a 5 out of 5, not far from it, right? So it's been out. I've sold more than 15,000 copies of this book and I've had tremendous response, tremendous positive response by the people who buy it. And I think if you buy it, you'll be just as happy with it. Now, in addition to my book, I also have a website that I do and I'll tell you a little bit more about my website and show you some images from the website right now. Now my website is NevadaOutbackGems.com and I'll put a link to the prospecting page, this prospecting encyclopedia page down in the description below, but you can find it at Nevada Outback Gems. Uh, I sell some jewelry, turquoise, other gemstones there. Uh, I don't always keep the uh, inventory perfectly up to date. So if you're interested in anything you see, do contact me first before trying to send me money or anything because I want you to be able to get what you order. But the website has lots of different stories, old adventures, uh, even some stories, uh, true stories from the old time miners of the 1800s. So I think it's uh, something you'll find interesting. The other thing I want to go back to is that 
all my comments, I want you guys to ask questions on the comments for my videos. I answer 100% of the comments that are made on my videos. Now, sometimes if somebody just says, hey, great video, I really enjoyed it. You know, I, I, the comment may just be, well, I'm really glad you liked it. Uh, or, or, you know, if it's a simple question, um, and, and sometimes I get people who ask me questions, I would take a book to answer that question. And I recommend that they just buy the book. But I answer all my questions. I try to help people as much as I can. I'm here to help you. So if you're interested in gaining the skills, if you're interested in knowing what you need to know to be successful, follow along with me. Subscribe to my channel. Hit the bell so that they'll let you know when I come out with new videos. And I try to do that pretty much every Saturday morning. And you'll enjoy with me. You'll come along with me. We'll have an adventure together and we will find some nice gold and see what it's really like getting out in the woods or the deserts or the mountains, wherever we land, wherever the gold is, wherever the diamonds are, wherever the platinum is. Come along. We'll have some fun and I'll see you real soon on the next video.